Welcome back. In this video, we're going to cover the other way of doing a two-sample t-test, which is the p-value method. Any hypothesis test can be done using the critical value method or the p-value method. So um, a two-sample t-test, which, which is what we're covering now, can be done using either method. And all of the other hypothesis tests that we haven't covered can also be done using either method. So an f-test can be done using either method. A z-test can be done using either method. And in this video, we're going to go through some examples of doing the two-sample t-test using the p-value method. But first, we have to go over the definition of a p-value. So in a hypothesis test, the p-value is the probability of the test statistic reaching a certain value by chance alone. And this is really just a more technical way of saying the probability of the outcome, the observed outcome, reaching a certain point by chance alone. So as a simple example, let's imagine a series of 50 coin tosses. If you toss a coin 50 times and you count the number of heads, one possible outcome is 30 heads out of 50. And that outcome of 30 heads has a p-value. And the p-value of 30 heads is the probability of the number of heads reaching 30 simply by chance, meaning um, without any other factors going on, like an unfair coin toss or um, or an unfair or an unfair coin. And if you toss a coin 50 times, another possible outcome is 40 heads out of 50. And 40 heads has its own p-value. And um, in that situation, the p-value of 40 heads would be the probability of the number of heads reaching 40. Um, simply by chance, with nothing else going on. And 45 heads, which is another possibility, has its own p-value. And the p-value of 45 heads is the probability of 45 heads being reached by chance alone. So um, every possibility has its own p-value. And um, the p-value of 30 heads is actually the probability of the number of heads reaching 30 or something higher, because when I say when I say reaching 30, I mean being exactly 30 or something higher. That's what I mean by reaching. So, and when I say the probability of reaching 40 heads, what I'm meaning is coming out to 40 or something higher, because if it comes out to exactly 40, 40 is reached, and if it comes out to let's say 42, 40 is reached. And um, if you look at if you looked at those, if you looked at the p-values of the three outcomes that I just mentioned, um, which are 30, 40, and 45, um, 45 would have the lowest p-value out of those three outcomes because 45 is the least likely to happen by chance. And 30 would have the highest p-value because that is the most likely to happen simply by chance out of those three possibilities. So um, the so a p-value is just a way of measuring how confident you are that the um, that an outcome didn't happen by chance. So if if you observe an outcome and the outcome you observed has a high p-value, it means you observed an outcome that's likely to happen by chance and you're not confident that anything else is going on other than just chance. So if you toss a coin 50 times and you get 30 heads, your outcome will have a high p-value because that's likely to happen simply by chance. And you're not going to be confident enough to say that, that there's anything else going on like an unfair coin or an unfair toss. You're just going to assume that the 30 heads happened by chance, that the 30 out of 50 happened by chance. But if you toss a coin 50 times and you get 45 heads, um, your, your observed outcome will have a low p-value because that's not likely to happen by chance. And you're going to be able to confidently say that, that something else is going on, like an unfair coin toss, something other than just chance. Um, so overall, if you get a, so overall, um, when the p-value comes out to a high number, your, your observed outcome is likely to happen by chance and you're not confident that anything else is going on other than just chance, 
if the p-value comes out to a low number, you have an outcome that's not likely to happen by chance, and you're confident that something else is happening other than just uh, chance factors. So uh, this slide just um, covers what I just talked about. So I, here I'm just giving an example of an outcome that would have a small p-value, 48 heads out of 100, um, an outcome with a large p-value, um, seven heads out of 100, um, Actually, um, let's see, let's move ahead. Let's go into the steps of doing a, a two sample t-test. So in a two sample t-test, the And it, so now let's talk about how a p-value works in a two-sample t-test. So in a two-sample t-test, um, each possible t-score has its own p-value. So um, negative, let's say negative 1.2 has a p-value, um, 3.5 has a p-value. Now that we've covered a simple example of, of how a p-value works, let's talk about how a p-value works in a two-sample t-test. So um, we know that in a two-sample t-test, you calculate a t-score, and the t-score comes out to some number. In a two-sample t-test, every possible t-score has its own p-value. So 3.5 has a p-value, 3.7 has a p-value, 4.1 has a p-value, or negative 1.2 has a p-value. And t um, a t-score further from zero will have a lower p-value because um, t-scores further from zero are less likely to be reached simply by chance. So, for example, um, 4.2 4 has a smaller p-value than 1.5, because 4.2 is further from zero, and 4.2 is less likely to be reached by chance. Um, and in a two-sample t-test, using the p-value method, what you do is you calculate your your t-score with your data set, and then you calculate the p-value of your t-score, and then that p-value tells you um, how likely your t-score is to be reached by, by chance. And if, if your p-value comes out to a small number, then you know that you observed an outcome that's unlikely to happen by chance, and that's when you can confidently say that your results are not due to chance factors, and you reject the null hypothesis, basically. So now let's go over the steps of a two-sample t-test using the p-value method. So the first, the first four steps are the same as with the critical value method. So you, um, you set up your H0 and H1, which are your null and your alternative. You randomly sample from two populations. You collect your data, and you calculate your t-score. Um, step five is where um, things change. So now you, you take your t-score and you calculate the p-value of your t-score. And then what you do is you compare the p-value to something called the alpha level. And the, the alpha level is the probability of a type 1 error. So uh, back in my video on introduction to hypothesis testing, I mentioned that the uh, probability of a type 1 error is set in advance. It's set by the researcher, and it's typically set to 0.05. That's what people agree on. And when it's set to 0.05, what you do is you you take your p-value and you compare it to 0.05, and you reach a decision and a conclusion based on that. And um, 0.05 goes along with the 95% confidence level. So if, um, you remember how back when we did the critical value method, we looked up the critical value from the table for 95% confidence? Um, if, you're, if you're doing the p-value method and the p-value comes out to um, 0.05, what that means is your t-score reached that critical value 
for 95% confidence. So, so hopefully you're getting to see how the, the p-value method is just another way of doing the same thing as, as you did with the critical value method. Because if the p-value reaches 0.05, you've actually, that actually tells you that you've reached that 95% um, critical value. Then what do you do? Like I said, you, you make a decision and a final conclusion. And here's a summary of what will um, happen, of what can happen using the p-value method. So if the t-score is a negative number and the p-value is 0.05 or less, what you do is you uh, reject the null hypothesis and you, um, you conclude that the mean of population one is lower than the mean of population two. Uh, because um, if the t-score is negative and the p-value is 0.05 or less, that means that your t-score is in the negative rejection region. If the t-score is a positive number and the p-value is 0.05 or less, you reject the null hypothesis and you confidently conclude that the mean of population one is higher than the mean of population two. That's because if the t-score is positive and p is 0.05 or less, the t-score is in the positive rejection region, which we learned about earlier. And if the t-score is above 0.05, um, you always retain the null hypothesis and you just say you're not confident that the population means are different. Um, that's because if the p-value is above 0.05, um, you, your t-score is in the non-rejection region. It's between the two critical values. Um, so uh, we have, in, in the p-value method, we have the same three areas that we did with the critical value method. We have the negative rejection region, the non-rejection region, and the, and the positive rejection region. And once again, each area leads to its own conclusion. And when you use the p-value method, the p-value actually tells you if your t-score is in one of the rejection regions. Because if, if t is negative, and p, well, first of all, if p is 0.05 or less, you know your t-score is in one of the rejection regions, one or the other. And if the t-score is negative, it's the negative rejection region. If t is positive, it's the positive rejection region. And if p is above 0.05, you're in the um, non-rejection region. So this is a way of doing the two sample t-test without having to look up the critical value. It's a way of determining if the, if the critical value was reached without actually knowing what the critical value equals. Um, so now let's just go over a couple of examples. So here we have our first, um, we have our research question, which is the same as in the last video. Uh, do working college students tend to be sleep deprived? And we have our data again, the mean and standard deviation of sample one and the mean and standard deviation of sample two. The null and the alternative are the same. And the t-score is calculated using the same formula, negative 4.29. And now in part C, what we do, so part B was the t-score. In part C, we calculate the p-value. So what we need, what we do, is we can go to this p-value calculator, which is available online, and enter in our t-score and our df. So in the last video, I, I mentioned that df in a t-test is n minus one. So if we have a total of fifty, if we have fifty people uh, in each sample, fifty minus one would be forty-nine. So let's enter that into this calculator right here. So negative 4.29 and a DF of 49. So it tells us that the p-value is less than 0 0.0001, which means that it's just really small, basically. And that's why I just said here that it's less than this number. So if, if that's what the p-value calculator tells you, just tell me that it's less than 0 0.0001. And 
Uh, I'm going to skip over part D for just a second here. Um, so now let's let's reach a decision about um, H0, about the null hypothesis. So if the p-value is less than 0 0.0001, it's definitely less than 0 0.05. And notice how the t-score is a negative number. And I told you earlier in this video that if t is negative and p is 0 0.05 or less, those two things together tell you that the t-score is in the negative rejection region. So we know that our t-score is in the negative rejection region out here, um, which starts at this negative critical value. And that actually leads to our conclusion, our final conclusion. So what we're going to do with this t-score right here is reject the null hypothesis and conclude confidently that the mean of working students is lower than the mean of non-working students. That's just because it's in the negative rejection region. And here I have a diagram. So um, this is, so let me explain what, what's happening here. So the p-value is calculated using a curve called a t-distribution. That's where the p-value comes from. And the, the, um, the area that, that's beyond the t-score in the tail is one half of the p-value. And the other half of the p-value starts at the opposite of the t-score out here. So if, um, if let's say, let's, if, if our t-score is negative 4.29, then one half of the p-value is this area that's beyond negative 4.29 going to the left. And the other half of the p-value starts at 4.29 and goes to the right. So it's, um, so like I said, um, the p-value is split in half, and one half of it is at the left end, and one half of it is at the right end. And here we have another example. So once again, our H0 and H1 are the same. The t-score is the same. It's, in this case, it's 0.36. And now we have p from t. We enter the, the, the t-score into the p-value calculator, and we get 0.36. I'm sorry, I didn't say that right. The t-score is 0.36, and we're going to be entering that into the calculator. It's positive 0.36. And uh, the DF is still 49 because that's the sample size minus 1. Compute P. In this case, we get 0.7204 as our P value. And that's definitely above 0.05. So if t, if, remember, if p is above 0.05, then we know that the t-score is in the non-rejection region. That's from the table I showed you earlier. <clears throat> so our decision will be to retain the null hypothesis, to not reject it. And following from that, our conclusion is that there's not enough evidence to conclude that there's a difference between the mean sleep time of working and the mean sleep time of non-working. So now I've shown you um, two examples of how to do a two-sample t-test using the p-value method. So the, the p-value takes the place of the critical value, basically. And let me show you one more diagramming example. So right here where I say t, this is the t-score of 0.36 right here. And out here we have negative 0.36, which is the opposite of the t-score. Um, so it's it's t it's our t-score and the opposite of our t-score. And the the p-value of of 0.7204 is split in half. So um, 
one half of the p-value is the area beyond our t-score, and the other half of the p-value is the area beyond the opposite of our t-score going in this direction. So here we have, well, 0.36 and negative 0.36 here and here, and one half of the p-value is um, going out this way from 0.36. And the other half of the p-value is going out this way from negative 0.36. And um, so let's divide our p-value by 2 to split it in half. So 0.7204 divided by 2 is 0.3602. That's why I'm saying that this blue area is 0.3602, and this other blue area is 0.3602, because when you add the two tails, you get the total, uh, which is the p-value, 0.7204. Um, so if you want to try it yourself, try adding 0.3602 and 0.3602. And if you add those two numbers, you'll see that they add up to 0.7204, which is the p-value. And right here, um, I didn't say what the critical value is. But I just said CV because that's the position of our positive critical value and the position of our negative critical value. We could look them up in a table if we wanted to, but we, we don't, since we're doing the p value method, we don't have to know what they are. And what I'm saying here is um, when, when you're setting your alpha to 0.05, which I said is typically done, then the critical value that you're using actually has a p-value of 0.05. And when you split that in half, the area here is 0.025, and the area here is 0.025. Um, so the, the positive rejection region is 0.025 of the area, and the negative rejection region is 0.025 of the area, and the two, the two rejection regions add up to this p-value of 0.05. Um, so um, if, if the t-score landed right at the critical value, and the t-score was right here, um, and you, the p-value then would be um, exactly 0.05. And yeah, so, so this is how, um, I just wanted to give you a little bit more explanation of, of what this diagram is, is showing. And uh, let's see. If you, have any, if you have any questions about this um, before the homework is due, just let me know. I can give you um, a couple more uh, diagrams, maybe through announcements, uh, possibly. And yeah, that's it for this video.